Science, of course, is not magic. Anyone who's done any science, it's really, I've heard it said that it's really just the Socratic method. So Socrates had this philosophical tool, was just to ask questions. And you keep asking questions and you don't stop asking questions. And, and science does that. Theology oftentimes forecloses on questions. <laughs> uh, and I don't think the Hebrew Bible does that at all. You read from Job earlier, there's a book that doesn't really foreclose on questions. questions. <laughs> except when you get to the end and he's, God kind of says, I'm God and you're not. Uh, but there's this constant dialogue and argumentation in, in the Hebrew scriptures as well. And I, I think theology and science are both examples of what you call critical realism, which in a philosophical perspective is simply that you assume there's something external to yourself, but you understand that you view that through certain filters and worldviews, and so you've got to keep going through this spiral of questioning your assumptions and looking at the data and questioning your assumptions and looking at the data. And in a climate change science, for example, uh, the data is what we observe about the atmosphere and its paleoclimate records and so on. Um, in theology, it's the entire of the created order and not just um, our texts. A few brief things. Climate change science, as we might understand, it's been around at least 150 years since the Industrial Revolution when we started burning fossil fuels. And Arrhenius did some calculations and he gets kind of the the broad range of temperatures we expect for doubling of carbon dioxide, but he thought it'd take a thousand years at, because of the rate at which fossil fuels were being burnt at the time. Um, in, in terms of the, what we see, we've got roughly uh, a couple hundred years of direct observations of temperature records, but with the time that thermometers have been around. But then we can go back much further, in firstly in terms of things like tree rings, coral cores, records of the extent of um, glaciers, and so on and so forth. And that goes back to about AD 200. And then beyond that, you've got ice cores and even fancier chemistry that goes back millions and millions of years. Here's a, an object lesson about science. So there are at least three major government centres that take the, the temperature observations and the paleoclimate records and they do various statistical things to them. You can't use raw data. You can't. So, for example, in Melbourne, we used to have this little triangle of land where there's the white levered box that took the temperatures. Very, very influenced, obviously, by the traffic going past in the built-up area. So they moved the site to Olympic Park. And so you need to correct the data and have both of these stations running together for a long period of time so you know what the relationship between the two is. Uh, observing sites have moved from towns to airports, all sorts of things. You've got um, the urban heat island effect. So the statistics that are used to correct those things are not a trick, they're not a lie, they're simply being honest about the quality of the data. And so the three international centres, there's two in the US and one in the UK, you see the, their records in the IPCC reports and they have to do all those things. So let's assume, for example, you're, you're sceptical about meteorologists and you think that they're, they're twisting and they don't understand statistics and the science and so on and so forth. So you set out to reconstruct the entire thing from scratch. Let's say you have a degree in physics and you pull together a team of, of scientists, including Nobel Prize winning physicists. Now this whole project is funded by a wealthy American industrialist, the Charles Koch Foundation. Such a thing happened several years ago and the physicist was Richard Muller. And Richard Muller is a darling, or was a darling of the climate denial community because he was highly skeptical of the methods and the statistics uh, and set out to do the whole thing from scratch himself. At the end of that, and it's a video I often like to show, and if I'd had a PowerPoint presentation, I would have shown it, but you'll just have to take my word for it and look it up later. He says two things, oh, it, says, it says a number of things, but the, the two main points is that he was able to look at the data and account for all the systematic errors. And in fact, he included more data than the climate change scientists would include because they thought, oh, it's less than 30 years or it's of dubious quality. He would include that data but weigh it appropriately. Now, how confident are we of this? In fact, he went back further uh, than Michael Mann, the so-called hockey stick, if you've heard about that. And what he found, essentially, that within some small errors, he was in total agreement with the three other major centres, that the planet was indeed warming. And it's in, in this interview, he goes, through, oh, I fitted it with a, an exponential curve that wasn't much of a fit. Fitted it with a parabola, with the American population increase, da 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 And then he fitted uh, emissions of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, and it was a smack on fit. And that, he says, he did not expect. So what he was doing was he was approaching the data from scratch with what we refer to as scepticism. Now that's a word that's thrown about quite a bit and it's misused because scepticism is a fundamental tool in science. Uh, I've given talks, I remember giving a talk many, many years ago at the ANU 
and I presented some data. I was doing a, a master's in astrophysics at the time and I wasn't skeptical enough about my results. And someone pointed something out. I went back and found there was an error in my code. You know, problem corrected. So skepticism is a fundamental tool of saying, do I really trust this? Do I understand it? And until I can demonstrate something, either with a numerical simulation or a calculation or some really good observations, I can't, be, I can't make a categorical statement about it. Uh, where was I going with that? train of thought. Uh, so Muller's gone and, and done this again to his satisfaction. He was skeptical but not a denialist. In other words, it was not his necessarily his world view per se that was driving his rejection of the science, but a genuine, I don't know about this. Now some people could, could say that he was being entirely arrogant to do this. You had three major international centres that had collected the data and shown this was the case. But what it does illustrate is that there are some things in science that are repeatable that you can do over and over and over again. But we don't need to do this over and over and over again. So the rest of what I'm saying this morning is not going over the science again. I can do that stuff later, but I'm not interested in doing it anymore. Because what we need to do now, particularly as the church, is to understand the situation we live in and how we respond best as the church. But I do want to make a couple more kind of both scientific and social science type statements. And that's to put global warming in a broader context. And that broader context is something known as the Anthropocene. Has anyone heard that term before? Hands up, just to let me know, okay. Last night. Hmm. <laughs> Last night. So you'd be aware of the fact that there are... Could you please just repeat the term? Oh, Anthropocene. Anthropocene. So anyone who's familiar with geology will know that uh, the geological past is broken up into various eras and eons and so on based upon certain measurable things. So 66 million years ago, a giant bolide or meteorite smacked into the earth in the Yucatan Peninsula in Central America. And below that uh, geological layer, you have dinosaur fossils. In fact, there's something, just some, some somewhat contentious research recently where someone thinks they've found the actual event, including fo a fossil assemblage that's just been blown by huge tsunamis, etc., as a direct result of the impact. Above that, you don't find dinosaur fossils, and in between in the layer, you find things like a rare earth metal called iridium in concentrations that match those of meteorites. So you're able to say, here's a geological era, below here and above here, and here's the boundary. And this happens again and again and again. The Carboniferous, for example, coal deposits, because that's when we had lots of um, swamps and, and material was decaying and, and forming coal. So the Anthropocene is an attempt to understand humanity as a geological force. But the problem is we're right in the middle of it. We're not looking back at it. And there's been debates as to the exact nature of the Anthropocene. Some people would put it back when humans moved into Europe and started wiping out the mammoths and other large megafauna. Others would put it at the start of agriculture because, of course, from there on we started clearing large tracts of forest. So you think um, the English moors are a natural feature of the UK, although the, all the forests were cleared. Uh, when um, Britain was settled. Others would put it at the uh, so-called Columbian Exchange, which is a euphemistic way of talking about the fact that some 65 million North Americans died due to human uh, European diseases and war and enslavement. So your traditional idea of the Indians in their teepees and going around on horseback is a myth. They had settled cities and agriculture just as they did here in Australia, if you've read Dark Emu or The Greatest Estate on Earth. Or you can put it at the start of the Industrial Revolution where we started burning fossil fuels in earnest. Or, and the geological Anthropocene is normally now placed, although not officially, uh, by the geological community as 1950 when we let off the first atomic bomb. And that marks the Great Acceleration where population increased rapidly after the war, consumption of fresh water, um, consumption of fertilisers and all these sorts of things that have impact. Now, climate change represents the pressing uh, or pushing of one of nine planetary boundaries. And these planetary boundaries are talked about in terms of what provides a safe operating space for human civilization. One, of course, is a stable climate, and that's stabilized more or less about 10,000 years ago. And that's when agriculture kicked off. Uh, a direct result, of course, of emitting carbon dioxide is the acidification of the oceans. And we know the imp impact that has on coral reefs and fisheries, etc., etc. Um, then you've got the ozone layer. We can say quite um, rightly that our contribution to global emissions is very small, so why would we bother changing it? But it's the largest per capita. In other words, we have the most hungry uh, lifestyle when it comes to fossil fuels globally. So it's possibly more accurate 
do say that a couple of things. Firstly, that the Anthropocene should probably go back at least to the so-called Columbian Exchange because the conquest uh, of the Americas is really the beginnings of capitalism and capitalism is the main driver of global emissions. And so people like to talk about the capitalocene because that's the main driver of our growth or the auxocene, which is the, the period of growth. Or some people even talk about the Cthulhu scene for those who are into H.P. Lovecraft. All right, moving right along. Uh, recently, I read in Forbes magazine online that the five largest publicly owned gas and oil companies spend approximately $200 million on lobbying designed to control, delay, or block binding climate motivated policy. And BP is the largest of these at $53 million. It greenwashes but also expands its extraction all the time and says, well, fossil fuels are going to be a part of the future energy mix for a foreseeable future. Why? Because they say so. And um, here's a book I can recommend. I reviewed this for, um, oh, I can't remember the publication now. Has anyone seen this? The Cold Truth? So it's all about Adani in Australia. And I just want to read a, a quick quote from this uh, before we move on. Uh, and this is a quote, uh, this is from actually Guy Pearce quoted from um, a quarterly essay piece. In the early 1990s, the Australian carbon lobby got busy. Their strategy was to prevent action by Australia, and if that failed, to delay action, and if delay failed, to shift the burden of emission cuts elsewhere. This meant nurturing seeds of doubt about whether climate change was caused by burning fossil fuels, and that greenhouse constraints would wreck the entire Australian economy. That's Guy Pearce. Uh, so that was in a quarterly essay. But this book that I highly recommend, The Cold Truth, is by David Ritter, who works for Greenpeace. There's uh, a piece at the start by um, Adrian Baragaba, who, of course, has um, been fighting legal battles to protect his, his um, ancestral lands. There's some stuff from people from the, um, the Climate Council in part two, and a number of different contributions, some poetry in it. It's a fantastic book. Um, so what I want to do now is to, to, to given that, uh, so before I get, one more thing before I go on is I never want to say that each and every one of us is not part of this system, that we don't contribute to it and not personally responsible. But the biggest lie of, of, of capitalism today is to say that the entire emphasis of, of turning about uh, the Titanic falls on the individual consumer when it's the system that needs to change as well. And that's the focus of the rest of what I want to say. And I'm going to read um, from two of my books, uh, some short sections, and then turn it over to discussion. So the first one is from this book, All Things New, God's Plan to Renew Our World. And I've pinched an essay I wrote for uni for this chapter uh, on Walter Wink, for those who may be familiar with his work. The fall and the effects of human sin are often thought of in purely individual terms. This leaves much to be desired and falls short, pardon the pun, of the biblical witness on the topic. Climate change is not simply the result of a collective of, a collective of individuals gone wrong, but the whole structure of society and its power structures. The fall narrative doesn't end with Adam and Eve ejected from the garden, but with the scattering of the people of Babel. Theologian and activist Walter Wink has written extensively about the fallen nature of the power structures of society, including its spiritual elements, and so his approach is worth examining. Wink identifies the powers that we read of in the Bible as, quote, the systems themselves, the institutions and structures that weave society into an intricate, intricate fabric of power and relationships, end quote. The powers themselves are necessary for an ordered society, but they can also be a source of great evil. Wink dismisses as gross literalism the idea that the powers are angelic or demonic beings, and yet, at the same time, wants to dismiss materialism, the idea that the powers are nothing but an aspect of material reality that a, socialist, a so, sorry, sociologist could study. Instead, he sees, for example, the angels of the seven churches in Revelation 2-3, not as supernatural beings, but as the corporate personality of the church, its ethos or spirit or essence. On the one hand, Wink helps orient us correctly to examine the spirituality of systems and organisations, to understand that they can take on a life of their own that transcends the total of the individuals within it. He also points to why it is not enough to convert individuals in order to end oppression, 
but rather to change systems. He points out that good and necessary systems can go bad and become oppressive. Their angel becomes a demon. You know, I don't fully, fully follow him, but nonetheless, I think it's a helpful approach. Um, one of Wink's key texts is Colossians 1.16. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. All things, including the powers, were created through and for Christ. And I'll go through a little bit of the Greek text, which I don't think that we'll do this morning. Um, um, but uh, he goes on to talk about the spiritual powers are the inner aspect of material or tangible manifestations of power, precisely because we encounter them primarily in reference to the material or earthly reality of which they are most, uh, which are their most inner essence. So he's talking about the fact that organizations, whether it's governments or big business or fossil fuel companies or whatever else, they take on a life of their own. They have a spirituality. So we can't reduce um, the problems of the day to mere politics or mere science or mere whatever else. He's saying that we can address these things on a spiritual level and the church has the ability to do that. Perhaps Wink's most useful insight is that of Ephesians 3.10. The church makes known God's wisdom to these powers. He reads the powers in this context as the angels of the Gentile nations, but the overall point is that to be the church, living by Christ's self-sacrificing and serving nature, is a testimony to these powers that their sovereignty is not absolute. Hence, our mandate in Ephesians 3.10 can't be merely materialistic, but must be spiritual as well. Evangelism is always social action, and social action is always evangelism. And I come from the evangelical tradition that wants to break the two and denigrate one and uplift the other. Proclaiming the sovereignty of Christ over the powers is an act of critique of idolatry and empire. While the powers can be considered in isolation together as an overarching network, they form the domination system. And Wink identifies this domination system as cosmos, which is the Greek word used for, word for, used for world in John's Gospel. Uh, and he describes this as the human sociological realm that exists in estrangement from God. But the cosmos in John's gospel is created by God, fallen, but is redeemable by God. So we don't so demonise the other, demonise fossil fuel companies, mining companies, etc., etc., as if they were beyond redemption. Or indeed, if we were any more fallen than them. Or any less fallen than them, sorry. Applying this then to the problem of climate change, for example, we need to address the fact that the powers, in this case, are big energy companies who either deny or deliberately obscure the truth about what they are doing. Rather than serving the good of the cultural mandate of Genesis 1, 26 to 28, to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, they continue to commit the evil of damaging God's good creation because their spiritual aspect has become corrupt, driven by the desire to maximise profit. Exxon apparently knew about climate change 40 years ago, but at best sat on the knowledge, now claiming that their conclusions were not as stark as made out, and yet they have been implicated in funding think tanks that promote climate change denial. I was trying to remember the name of this last night. The American Enterprise Institute, which is funded by fossil fuel companies, actively obscures and denies the science. What this shows is that the spirituality of a system can be so wrong that individual conversion to faith is not enough. The very spirituality of a system needs to be changed. ExxonMobil could invest in renewable energy. As a company, it must either change or go out of business. Justice must be done and corruption must be rooted out. Exxon's spiritual intransigence is seen in its counter-suing lawyers who are suing it because Exxon denied, fossil fuel, uh, defied, denied findings of climate change scientists despite knowing that the use of fossil fuels posed grave risks to the planet. We cannot totally demonise the company or its employees, but a spade is a spade, sin is sin, and change non-violently achieved is essential. Prayer will be a big part of this, and so will all sorts of sacrifices. This is, after all, how the powers have always been challenged. So that's one lens. It's viewing uh, the powers. Have we got a little bit longer? All right. Uh, the other one I want to do is to, and I may not actually bother to read from this but to paint the picture instead. You'd all be familiar with the parable of the Good Samaritan and it's very much a parable of justice. Uh, it sums up the entire of the, the law to love God and to love neighbour and Jesus obviously is telling it in the context of a teacher of the law trying to limit how justice is applied and, and Jesus says well you, 
here's an example of a Samaritan, not someone who um, you, I'm telling you you are to love in this particular context, but showing how a Samaritan could be far infinitely superior in love and justice to you who seeks to limit it. And remember the Samaritan said the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, and not the rest. And, and so Jesus is saying to a teacher of the law, you know all of this, you've got the entire library, here's someone who's only got a small section, and yet they could do a better job than you. And the parable in the foreground describes restorative justice. So here's a man whose liberty is taken away from him, his ability to work, his ability to earn and provide for his family in a patriarchal society. And he's near death and someone has sacrificed their time and their money and their energy and their animal, their beast of burden, has sacrificed uh, their similar to restore this man to health because the whole picture of the parallel of the Good Samaritan isn't about one individual being infinitely reliant upon charity but being restored to a position in life where their dignity is restored and their ability to look after themselves is restored. So here's a parable that's a picture of restorative justice. But the question that's not often asked is where does the bandit come from? Why was the bandit doing what they were doing? And maybe I should read because I say it very eloquently <laughs> or at least more eloquently than I'm probably going to, be able to do it at the moment. This is why some of us write because we can be more constrained than when we speak. All right. Uh, and it's going to be kind of lengthy if I do this. All right. So one of the things that we need to understand is, who's seen The Life of Brian? I know it's not a very Christian movie, quote, unquote. But you remember the scene. You remember the scene. Um, so Brian is this wannabe, is mistaken for a messianic pretender, a wannabe revolutionary. And when the Judean People's Front gather, um, there's this discussion of what has Rome ever done for us? <laughs> yeah, and, and all these things are listed like postal service and aqueducts and so on and so forth. It's worth, worth noting that the reason there was an aqueduct into Rome is probably because the, you couldn't drink the water out of the river Tiber because it was polluted. But anyway, what did Rome really bring to the, um, the world outside its, its own uh, walls of the city was the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. Firstly, we invade your country via military conquest. Then if you resist, we crucify you. <laughs> and then we tax you into oblivion. Professor of Classics John Richardson suggests that warfare and conquest was the principal activity that occupied the Roman Senate and was the main focus of their foreign policy. Does that sound familiar? Furthermore, Roman historian J.A. North makes four points that indicate that Roman warfare was deliberately aggressive. Both the expectation and the social ethos of Romans of high and low status was geared to regular war making. They had the attitudes and habits to go with this way of life. Many Romans, including all those who had a major influence on policy decisions, made, and knew they made, large profits out of warfare and out of the expansion of the empire. Does that sound familiar? Expansion was a publicly stated aim, uninhibited by the laws that govern treaties. Treaties were there to be broken. Roman wars were often aggressive in intention, if not formally so. So we're going to talk a little bit about empire later. Uh, Brian Walsh and Sylvia Keysmat in their book Colossians Remixed, Subverting the Empire, which is a book I can highly recommend, say that empire is totalizing by definition. In the words of the psalmist, imperial mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. Empires are built on systematic centralizations of power and secured by structures of socioeconomic and military control. They are religiously legitimated by powerful myths that are rooted in foundational assumptions, uh, and they are sustained by a proliferation of imperial symbols that capture the imagination of the populace. Like American presidents signing Bibles or flags draped over crosses. Um, there's an extended thing in here I won't read now. You should buy the book. It's really good. Um, <laughs> where Keith Hopkins suggested that um, the Roman Empire was essentially split into a threefold military and taxation structure. It was built around taxes. Actually, this is a, a good quote from him. The model implies an increased monetization of the Roman Empire, uh, Roman economy, the commercialization of exchange, an elongation of the links between producers and consumers, the growth of specialist intermediaries, that is traders, shippers and bankers, and an unprecedented level of urbanization. The model illustrates the close connection between changes on the level of individual action by simple peasants and relatively large scale changes such as the growth of towns which sounds like the urbanisation that's an implicit part of the, the Anthropocene today. So what happened basically was that 
uh, peasant farmers were heavily taxed and uh, artisans were taxed and they had to sell goods to make money and all that money and all the goods and services went both into Rome, the centre center of empire, and out to the boundaries to feed the huge army. Um, I think the single, single business, biggest uh, item on the American budget is the military. So if you lived in the first, cent first century Palestine, you paid a Roman tax and you paid a temple tax and if you had a bad season, uh, the Her Herodians who ran the temple were more than happy to buy up your land for you. So uh, you ended up either as uh, one of the day workers that we read about in Jesus' parables or the following. So we can now turn to the bandits of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Sometimes the word is translated as robbers or thieves, but this is inadequate. In Greek, the word kleptes means thief, and from, from which we get the English word kleptomaniac, the compulsive thief. But instead, uh, the word that we read uh, in Luke um, is less there, and this means more than mere thief. In fact, it's essentially a guerrilla uh, fighter or uh, a Robin Hood, if you like. The Jewish historian Josephus uses Lestai to refer to Jewish social banditry, a form of primitive rebellion often found under oppressive situations such as a Jewish life under Roman rule. And so basically the idea is that the reason that you had the injustices in the first place of the, the man being waylaid by the bandits was severe and profound taxation, a whole corrupt system that produced people who felt they had no other alternative than to rebel violently against the system. And given that the priest and the Levite in the parable were direct beneficiaries of the temple tax, the reason that they didn't stop wasn't that they didn't want to get their hands dirty and become ritually unclean, but because they feared being overtaken by the violence of the system that they had benefited from in the first place. So I guess what I, I then want to say to us this morning is when we think about uh, the violence inherent in the system, and now I'm thinking of the Holy Grail, Monty Python morning, um, that we need to address the problem of climate change and the Anthropocene in two ways. The first is the restorative justice, uh, and that's where things like the, the Green Climate Fund, which our government's now telling us they're not going to contribute to anymore, or foreign aid, which is at the lowest, debt, uh, lowest levels ever after six years of being cut. Uh, we need to up our game and bind the wounds of those who are damaged by climate change in our way of life, on the one hand, but the parable of the Good Samaritan in the backstory tells us that we need to radically deconstruct the system, which comes back to my first kind of framing, which is challenging the powers. Are you saying we should try and break into Exxon and annihilate the, you know, the governing agency? Oh, the obviously we need to do things non-violently. Oh, sorry. Um, I so I, I guess what I'm saying is that, not that I'm holding up the Lestai or the bandits as a model, but I'm saying if you understand where the violence in the story in the parable of the Good Samaritan comes from in the first place, yes. there's a broader violence, and that's of Roman Empire and indeed the temple system, which became oppressive, which is kind of interesting when you think about it. And you go back to the parable of the Good Samaritan. No one, none of us should aspire to be the priest or the Levite, but to be the Samaritan, to actually get our hands dirty.